Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on deal making in the COVID-19 presented to you by ASA and Associates in Juriscope. I'm Dashi Shah, Director with Juriscope. Hope everyone is staying safe and well. We meet today in these unprecedented times fighting a pandemic that has brought the world economy to its knees. The m and world isn't untouched. As we look forward, it is critical to understand the challenges one may encounter at each stage of the deal and be prepared accordingly. Before we begin, I bring to you a brief about ASA and Associates, Juriscorp, and our speakers for today's webinar. ASA and Associates is a 30-year-old accounting and consulting firm with a team of over 700 professionals spread across eight offices in India. A major part of their focus is on foreign companies setting up and operating in India. Today, ASA and Juriscorp has assisted, advised, and also represented clients in various courts, tribunals, and other forums across India, covering a wide gamut of areas such as foreign investments into India, joint ventures, M&A, private equity, banking and finance, structured finance, real estate, dispute resolution and international arbitration, bankruptcy and restructuring, as well as challenge the validity of legislations. The firm has been consistently ranked in the top tiers over the years by various leading publications. The speakers for today's webinar are Mr. Nitin Arora from ASA and Associates and Mr. Arunab Chaudhary from Juriscorp. Nitin is the practice lead for transaction advisory services with ASA and Associates. He carries tremendous experience in partner search, business valuations, due diligence, business negotiations, and strategies. He is a board member to M&A Worldwide, which is a network of over 40 international investment banking firms across the world. He has worked on many buy and sell mandates across industries and has worked extensively with both PE and strategic clients on inbound and outbound transactions. Arunab co-heads Juriscorp's M&A, private equity and corporate commercial practice. He has represented corporates, funds and promoters at various facets of deal making and has been appreciated for his solution-oriented approach. He also specializes in the areas of securities market, competition law, regulatory and policy advisory, and tech law. Well, just a few things to note before we get started for today's webinar. All participants will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the question section in the chat. The presentation will then be followed by a question and answer session. A link with the recording to this webinar will be emailed to you soon after. Thank you, and I now hand it over to Nitin and Arunab. Thank you, Darshi. I'm glad that we are doing this webinar without a video because I look quite different than the picture on the screen, and I'm badly in need of a haircut. On that light of note, uh, I welcome everyone to this webinar on deal making in COVID era. I hope everybody is doing safe and fine. When me and Arunab were planning this webinar, we realized that a lot of webinars are happening on this topic by uh, big firms, by consulting firms, by VC circles. And then we realized that we should do a webinar which is slightly different and more practical and case based, which can give insight to our members, our clients, our associates on practical issues which we face in the deal making. In this webinar, we will discuss some life case studies, some case studies on situation based on various life stages of a deal and impact of COVID on that situation. Before we talk about MLA, let's briefly talk about what we are hearing every day. This is a, a, this is a pandemic or a situation which is once in a lifetime, I would say. It's, it's very unique and a different kind of an economic situation because all past depressions, great depressions, or economic situations were mainly demand-led. This is a unique situation where the both supply side is affected as well as the consumer demand is also dented. To give you put things in context, in April 2020, 
a single vehicle was sold in india that's the history or a record of its odds in the indian automobile industry and i just hope that record remains that way only no one knows whether the recovery will be a u shaped recovery whether it will be a v shaped recovery or an l shaped recovery the government is trying to give stimulus but honestly i think just like a covid medicine they are trying to give a dose which is not sure how much is needed what will be the impact on the economy and whether it will be sufficient or not it's a very very tricky situation and unfortunately we are not as rich as economies of us germany and japan where we can afford to have a lot of fiscal indiscipline between us before i go forward i would like to invite aruna if he wishes to add some views there yeah hey, thanks thanks nitin uh, welcome everyone uh, you are perfectly right nitin uh, from a legal perspective if i say that we are also seeing a same kind of a situation when it comes to closing the deal uh for a new deal lots of uh, renegotiations are happening and for already structured deal again parties are going back and looking it is that's a common scenario we see when there is uh, a gloom or a, or a depression in the economy so the, the same is the stand from the legal perspective also thank you very much abhinav thank you now moving on to mna i must confess i am as confused as most of you most probably are what is happening you we hear different type of news you can see on the slide you know at one hand companies are talking about deferring the sitting on cash conserving cash on the other hand we get a news of reliance getting fact checks like it's one week diwali and one week christmas it's, it's very very strange uh, market situation uh, also it said that crisis give birth to opportunity and i won't be surprised that in spite of all the talks of pay cuts and parlo indigo might actually go up and do a transaction with virgin australia that's the news that still to be verified but that's something which was reported uh japan announced a huge stimulus and we do a lot of work with japanese companies and they you know many of my clients call me that japan is giving a lot of uh, stimulus but if you read the fine print of it you know out of this 2.2 billion 90% of the funding is to bring back the production back to japan and not to other countries so how much will be the impact of that is also to be seen and then there are chinese companies which are like vultures looking at the value buying to buy companies for a diamond and nickel so it's it's and there are fdi restrictions being imposed so in nutshell it's very difficult to say what is in store for mnda and deal making in short run and even in the long run once the normal see returns because what is not going to be normal for a while that's what we feel and especially on the mnda side because it's it's a very very important strategic decision in the life cycle of any of the company whether covid or no covid whether u shape or v shape all deals mostly go through the life cycle which is on the slide right now uh, most of you might be aware of a deal cycle for the benefit of those a deal would typically start with finding the right investor or a target or you know then you go into the discussions on the term sheet loi valuation which is a very very critical stage then you find something which is called a non binding offer or a term sheet which then leads to a detailed financial tax environment to due diligence and then we come into the stage which is more concrete in terms of definitive agreements when they get signed your spas share purchase agreements shareholder agreements they get signed and then we have uh, at least a deal which is done and once it is closed and then kicks in all the post closing obligations in terms of future stakes earn outs call options put options so this is a typical deal life cycle and in our view and this is our view uh, that the biggest impact of covid will be on
to discuss in uh, detail and i will request aruna to take us through the case studies which we have so that we can talk about various situations thanks nitin uh, welcome everyone so from the perspective of taking you from what uh, nitin has uh, discussed just now with regard to the deal cycle so what we have seen right now is what all the various stages and what we believe will be the impact of covid on those stages now the way we have created our case study is that entity a is looking to acquire entity b and we have created four stages first is with regard to evaluation and negotiation stage where the parties are looking at each other the second is with regard to signing of the term sheet or letter of intent where the party has given a non binding commitment the third is between the execution the agreement has been signed but still the closing has to be done the, there are activity which seller and buyer has to perform in between and then there are post closing obligations which nitin has said rightly that there the deal has already been done and there are a lot of things at the stake at that point of time as well so now given this situation the analysis and the way we have done it that we have we will be sharing facts with you and on the basis of issues we have divided it into between commercial and legal issues commercial will be dealt by nitin and legal will be dealt by me now given this going ahead for first case study just give me a second yeah with the first case study where the deal evaluation is happening where the entity a has just started discussion with entity b and then lot of lot of information is required to be gathered before building a trust nda has been signed information memo has been exchanged between the parties but term sheet term sheet is still far away and at this situation covid kicks in for example lockdown has been announced now both the parties in a situation looking at this deal from a various perspective so i would like nitin to throw some light over the commercial issues where these parties will be dealing to negotiate or close this deal further over to you nitin yeah so as i have already said that the biggest risk in terms of a covid risk is at this stage because what can be the worst situation then the deal getting actually stalled so i think in my view uh, the biggest first risk is that the parties might decide to either stall the deal or defer the deal which is i would say the biggest risk at this stage then the other big stage uh, risk is on the valuation because valuation is the backbone for any transaction it's the most critical element which gets negotiated at bare in any of the deals and i think not, not no period before the valuation has been more critical than before then now because there are various methods which we use for valuation and each of the method would get impacted by the impact of covid and whatever is happening post covid also i think most of you would have got what the message is especially on the people who are on the finance side that there's a new term which is like eb tax which is earning before interest tax depreciation amortization and covid now uh, it might sound funny but fact is that we will be using this uh i won't be surprised that it is started using in all the information memorandums also because the impact of covid on the financials the revenues the cost is going to be significant and hence it's very very important of what normalize so anyways in a transaction we look at a normal price revenue or an ebitda but we normalize it for normally a one time items or an exceptional item here the impact of covid for whatever the three months of lockdown and its ripple impact which will happen in next months to come will have to be adjusted both in the historical financial as well as the business plan which we have made that would lead us to an issue which valuation method should we actually use for doing the valuation in this situation typically we use three to four methods one is book value but which is not very commonly used pcf discounted cash flow method the other method is called a comparable companies multiple method and a comparable transaction multiple method now basically comparable companies multiple and a transaction multiple uses the multiple based on some deals or some listed company which we try to apply to our system but this in my view has been a very commonly used method easy easy to understand easy to find deals but it will get reasonably impacted because whatever multiples we take now will get impacted to put things in context 
if i am doing a valuation today and if i take the multiples on 30th of march or 31st of march 2020 stock market crashed by 30% on march 24 2020 all the multiples which i will be calculating if i take 31st march as a base will have a huge huge variation i cannot straight away apply and multiply a multiple of that particular date to my ebitda to arrive at any valuation so first of all on dcf So on the on the comparable multiples, we will have to adjust the multiples. Look at maybe a trailing average or a forward average, or do some kind of an adjustment so that CCM or what you call it, a comparable companies and transactions, throw a right number. This will also lead to a more enhanced use of DCF, which is used, but I would say it is not used in every transaction. On simpler deals, we don't look at DCF too much. But given the situation, I think the use of DCF will be more. because people will try to do a valuation based on the future looking numbers because right now numbers nobody can predict you can't do a deal on a zero revenue on a zero cost basis so dcf is gain importance but that will also lead to issues which will come in the post uh, closing situation because dcf will then have earn out link to it you will have to have a performance based situation link to it you will also have to so you have to make sure that the business plan is very very realistic because if you make an unrealistic business plan it will bite you because you will have to then perform according to those business plan so these are few issues on the commercial side which i feel or we feel are very very relevant on the situation where a valuation is just being negotiated yeah so over to you uh, aruna on the legal side yeah yeah nitin so at this stage i will say the one of the most prominent things in the mind of the parties will be obviously the business and the commercial which nitin was dealing by the at the same time legal impact and the legal queries cannot be ignored at because there are few things because of this entire covid the things would have changed dramatically you know the major order books the major vendors your client customers may would have gone to negligible or a lower amount so what is important here from a legal perspective to look at the those agreements get dive deep into those agreements and to understand what has sustained and what is what is having a chance of being getting washed away because of this covid scenario so that has become one of the exercise which the seller should at least do it because that will be the next question to the seller from the legal side that please open the agreement and show it to us what is happening there you know the other important thing is that the seller what we need to understand from a regulatory perspective that where that seller is falling into now if i can give you an example the covid has impacted that is a truth but has it impacted all the all the business environment i do not agree what is important and what, this is a learning which we got from a covid that now the businesses can also be seen from the perspective of essentials and non essentials So if you are falling into non-essentials, the COVID has impacted you in a different way. If you are falling into essentials, the COVID has impacted you in a different way, which may be a positive way from a business perspective. So this new, you know, division of essential and non-essential from an investment and M&A perspective has also taken a lot of, you know, things. And people have analyzed the target from this perspective also. Now the last and the most important thing while doing a deal evaluation and negotiation at this stage is looking at from the perspective that how to restructure because right now there is no commercial binding on the parties and still lot of options are open for them to structure discuss create so that that discussions again goes on and again there are a lot of uh, you know brainstorming going back to the board drawing it once again understanding it once again so that that that's the from a from a legal perspective with regard to when someone when entity a is evaluating the deal and it's just in the first stage now from here moving it to second stage which is with regard to a, a a step forward now the parties have negotiated you know they have seen each other understood each other a little better and they decided to sign the term sheet a uh, definitive agreement still to be executed the term sheet has been signed a tentative business plan and valuation term has been determined and the dd the due diligence has commenced 
Now, at this stage, the COVID impact comes, lockdown gets announced, and party again sits after signing the term sheet that how to get this deal done, what all issues we should now look into. Now, again, from the commercial perspective, I'd like Nathan to uh, pitch in and give his views on it. Thank you. So in, in my view, I think this is also a very, very critical stage. We might have signed an LOI, but important thing to note here is that LOI or a term sheet is still a non-binding document. It's a non-binding on both the parties, which means each and everything which we have negotiated can be rediscussed, can be actually re renegotiated. It's not only linked to valuation, it can be linked to your board seat, it can be linked to your future stake sales, it can be linked to your honor. Everything which you have agreed can go for a toss. So, in my personal view, I think the best situation, because rather than stalling a deal or letting the deal go, best is to still renegotiate as long as your deal is, if, if there's a discuss, discussion between the buyer and the seller, the best is to renegotiate if still your deal is in this, what is called a zone of possible agreement. We use it very commonly called ZOPA. So if, even if I've got a value which I wanted, but I'm still happy to take a 10% less, I, I advocate one should do it because situation might not change very soon. Situation might even get worse. So today, one in a hand is better than two in the bush. I would still recommend that one should look at the value and if it's a possible zone to renegotiate, do they renegotiate. One must live to fight another day is what I strongly believe in. The other important fact here is during the stage is the due diligence. Now, due diligence has always been very, very critical. On all the transactions, we get a financial duty, that to be done. But I think due diligence will also become much more in-depth, much more, uh, because people will look at each and every cost item very, very carefully. Where can they cut costs? Has your order book, which has been shared before the term sheet, is still relevant? Will you still be able to generate those kinds of revenue in the future? What about contingent liabilities? You know. If you have asked employees to leave, can they come back and sue you? If you have not paid a rent to your landlord and you have renegotiated, is that something which will have a contingent liability or an impact on the financials in future? So these are the due diligence issues which will also emerge specifically out of the uh, uh, COVID situation. So what is the solution? The solution is to get structures in place. Rather than, you know, so what, one way is you reduce the value, but you also reduce the stake today. I will sell less for a lesser value and I will leave it to the future. Let me perform and let me get the situation to a normal post COVID and then let's talk about balance stake. So rather than letting the deal go, one of the ways reduce value but reduce stake also. That's what a little bit of a structuring might be needed at this stage. The other thing is that one must look at the financials and very, very carefully. You know, I, I talk about my firm, you know, we are looking at our financials very deeply because of clients and other things. But there are areas where you can save costs also. Costs will get saved, travel gets reduced, entertainment gets reduced. So if there has been a loss in revenue, does not necessarily mean there will be equal and loss in profit as well. So one has to, during this stage, you know, once you have already agreed a value and you're asking to be ready, renegotiated, one should go back and look at each and every number very carefully. That is the request only just because there wants to be a renegotiation or there is a genuine reason to be renegotiated. So I think a very, very in-depth analysis of numbers at this stage is also very, very critical from a commercial standpoint. Arnab, over to you. Yeah, thanks. So in this situation, whatever I discussed in case study one with regard to the, you know, the agreements with your uh, clients, customers, vendors, all those things are critical here also. So I'm not repeating them again here. But from a, so now in this situation, the term sheet has been signed and the diligence has been started. Now, what is important here to understand the litigation point of it? How many new litigations will we can foresee in future? Now, there are two aspects to it. One is with regard to, from the perspective of a buyer who don't want to take many more litigation or enter into a company where there are huge litigation threats. Second is from the perspective of uh, from the seller who don't want to give a rips and warranty which may not stand for next two months as well because the deal closing will take certain time post DD. So what is important here to you know do an overall analysis with the DD team and from a DD team perspective to understand what may go wrong, 
how much is required to be disclosed from the promoter side so every disclosure may be accepted may not be accepted by the purchaser but it will bring clarity and openness on the table so one of the view which we have been discussing when during these time that whenever we see the agreement agreement may be watertight but what's going in behind how is your client reacting to it is there a lot of emails coming back are they telling you that we cannot continue we are facing tight give us some relaxations and lots of other things needs to be discussed at this point of time but the other important aspect which comes here and which is which is a little uh, tricky one if suppose the, the seller has debt there is lender sitting on the seller now that lender is also worried for the debt servicing how the money will come if the business is not going to be as good as it was today whether i will get serviced or i will not get serviced if the coverage uh, security coverage is falling day by day then what step should i take now for purchase the perspective is very important to understand the lender perspective of the seller because in most of the cases even though the promoter feel the valuation is going down and i should pay back and not to do a deal but a lender may be weary and wants the seller to do the deal as fast as possible so that his he, his interest is secured in the entity so now that's a very very tricky situation because you know but but from a purchaser perspective it's also very important to understand that aspect the another important aspect which play a very important role here and which we have been seeing and which is linked to what nitin has said with regard to valuation when nobody knows what the actual valuation is and there are a lot of methods and all and it's a best estimation now from a, if suppose there is a already existing investor is sitting on the company who may want to continue or who may want to take an exit whatever the scenario typical shareholding agreement have anti dilution clauses which says that the last round valuation and the next round valuation for the investment purposes if the next round is below than the last round then these clauses are kicked in and the existing investor gets more shares at a discounted rate just to manage or just to bring him at par with when he has invested or if he would have invested today so what will be the impact of that dilution how the shareholding pattern will change where the new investor will get in is this or is it going to happen in a way that the minority shareholder because of this anti dilution suddenly holds more than 26% and he is going to have uh say on uh, on the uh, special resolution something more than what is there in his veto right so lots of other things has to be evaluated so when we are looking any dd right now in these kind of a situation we are emphasizing more from a purchaser perspective we are representing purchaser to understand how this anti dilution has been drafted for earlier agreements now as i said on the disclosure letter it becomes very crucial because how much to disclose what not to disclose for, because from a seller perspective he will like to bring a picture which is rosy which is good enough for a sale but at the same time he runs a risk of not disclosing and getting uh, into trouble and the last condition which is very typical to certain entities which obtain registration from regulators and other places we need to see the license condition and understand how this con uh, license condition is going to get impacted because of covid and is there any threat on these license or is there any arna bhai the hello i think we have Lost Runa Varuna. Once you join back, please pitch in. I can I can move to the next slide. Hello. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Apologies for the scene. So uh, I was. Uh... One second. Yeah. Screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I believe uh, uh, 
I was referring to the last uh, to the point with regard to anti dilution. That is clear. On the license condition, I was referring to a situation where, you know, if if someone is getting acquired because of certain license and registration they have taken from uh, regulators, then those license conditions are also required to be evaluated from this perspective. Whether that's that are there any condition which is going to be impacted because of COVID. Now, getting on to the third case study. Yeah, which is. Yeah, which is between execution and closing. Now, the parties have, uh, you know, passed through the stage of uh, or where I have already passed through the phase of term sheet. Signed it and then the negotiated the agreement. Now they have signed the definitive agreement as well, and they are moving towards closing the agreement signed. Now the CPs and other things are being completed by the seller, and buyer will give a CP completion certificate and is satisfied with all those things, and the deal will go through. Now during this stage, if COVID impact, how the things will be looked from buyer and seller perspective, both from a commercial and legal side. So Nathan, I hand it to you for commercial yeah. perspective. So I think this is a stage when one can take a little breather in my view because risk is low uh, from two sides, two perspectives. One is a technical issue and one is an emotional issue also. Uh, technical is that you have signed a binding agreement. So, you know, technically you can't go out of it. Uh, yes, you can. If I would say in the end, buyer always have a way to find a this thing. But unless and until there has been a huge impact in the business, unless and until actually in the red zone industry, there's a force measure, nothing is going to happen. And in fact, if there's a going concern issue itself, then there's a situation, but most likely a contract which is binding, it's very difficult to niggle out of it. So that's the technical side of it. And the emotional side of it is that this is a stage you have invested a lot of time, a lot of money in a transaction. So unless and until the intentions are not good, parties most likely are you know, likely to continue and go ahead and close the deal. So chances of deal falling or deal getting renegotiated are there, but I would say it is less and that's why I would categorize as a low risk right now. But the issue which would come up here is that CP, which is condition precedence, might not get fulfilled. For example, you know, if it's an asset purchase, you need a section 281 certificate from the income tax, you know, that every tax is being paid. Now, it's very, very difficult to get a certificate otherwise also. And right now in this COVID situation when banks are not working and the government is not working, to get anything out of a government is next to impossible. And same applies to things like pollution board clearances. You know, if you have to go to a bank and ask for a no objection for a change in sh shareholding, all these things are commercial stroke legal uh, uh, condition precedents which parties have to fulfill. And if you don't fulfill, that gives you a small window to one party, you know, to niggle out of a transaction. So, one has to be very careful that what's been negotiated as a CP, what's the timeline you've negotiated as a CP, is it possible to fulfill that or no? So this is very, very critical at this stage. The other thing is that uh, intentional, unintentional, you know, there might be a delay in things getting closed. And if you have budgeted some expenditures or your business plan is based on a funding which is to be received from an investor or a private equity, then you might have to also look at alternative venues of bridge financing or some kind of uh, you know a stop gap arrangement from a commercial standpoint that might get needed but i would still say the commercial issues are less at this stage and legal issues would be slightly more at this stage and with that i think Arunak, uh, you might want to talk about those issues yeah yeah in fact i will take a little longer on here so now see a lot of efforts and time has gone into making this deal right from both the parties they have done the DD, they have done numerous hours of negotiation. And I will say at this stage, the trust between the parties are at a at a very high side, you know. And that is the advantage both the parties have today when they are sitting between execution to closing. The trust is there. Now, to understand, the first and important thing is to see what is the long stop date, you know, till that date the agreement which has been executed will last and the commitment from parties will last. Now, if that date is falling somewhere around this lockdown, and if the parties feel that they're not able to manage it, better to get that extended at the first priority. 
you know there's no point in getting into a technical issues when the intent are so right so getting the long stop date is the first and foremost thing one should look at when they're looking into these covid scenarios and all those things now the other thing is with regard to cp which uh, uh, nitin has mentioned now you know we need to understand from a cp perspective that how the things are you know means whether the cp is very crucial is so crucial that uh, you know without this the deal cannot move forward obviously the cps are made cps because they are crucial but it's more from the business perspective and the risk perspective one should analyze second is that the extension or a waiver which can be granted most probably it will be extension or creating it as a condition subsequent if that is granted then whether that grant is because of the condition came coming out of this covid so that is important also when the, both the parties then the seller is coming and asking for extension or a waiver he will make it ample clear to the uh, purchaser the reason behind this waiver or extension and from a legal perspective we understand what will be the risk and impact all around it now on these kind of things now the other thing is that is the effort while getting into a definitive agreement the effort has been that the approvals and consents are you know acquired from regulators and lenders and whatever now we need to also understand that if the time is stretched and we are not able to uh, closing it the day which we anticipated then how these consent is going to last is it very conditional to the time is it conditional to the you know the the deal uh, the deal framework which we have shown to the regulator if those things are there a parallel exercise should also be run from regulatory consent perspective that whether we need to reapproach or the consent is not based on any kind of a covid situation now a minor aspect here is with regard to power of attorney and current shareholder because you know when you are doing lot of waiver extension uh, consent from regulators and all those things party suddenly realize that you know lot of things cannot be completed by passing letters to each other or that those things has to be recorded in a way that it becomes part of the agreement and now the party realize suddenly that uh, you know we need to do a small amendment agreement to our uh, original agreement and at this stage they find it difficult to locate the shareholder because of the lockdown and all these aspects and getting a uh, you know uh, the amended agreement signed so it's it's a good option to analyze it or preempt it and see where who to who, who all shareholders you can obtain a power of attorney so that if uh, amendment is required that sell through pretty easily now the material contracts terminated may result into a uh, material adverse effect now during the execution to closing there is a standstill situation right parties the seller is believed to not to change the situation not to do anything which you know brings a material adverse impact or the way the uh, purchaser has seen the balance sheet and the company and whatever those things are not being changed now these things are right now not in the control of the seller as well you know a good big contract getting terminated or getting suspended is something which a seller cannot control so what is the impact on the deal now it's very subjective question but now the way to be handled here from both side from the purchaser and the seller is that if the impact on these agreements and all these crucial things is because of the because of the covid then one has to understand that a window should be open to get it renegotiated when the situation normalizes so giving a extension to a customer rather than getting into a a litigation and terminating a contract will impact the deal you know favorably so always think from a perspective and from a seller side is always good if you show the purchaser that even though the agreement has gone for a termination or is getting uh, uh, postponed he the seller has the ability to go back to the uh, so customer and get it back now again the disclosure list i have already discussed i am not going into that again but it's like the intent of the seller to disclose it at the closing disclosure and the bridge funding which uh, nitin has said that uh, that becomes a very important game because lot of the time what we are even seeing in current scenario that the gap between execution to cp which was technically a 30 days is extending to 60 to 90 days which is raising a issue with regard to working capital and all those things now who better can a purchaser 
fill the gap right he understand the company if he is willing to take it forward he can cut a good deal and good structure again by doing a bridge funding or assisting the uh, seller to get a bridge funding now having said all these things the one of the important aspect is while negotiating these things it's always better since you cannot go and start a dispute at this stage to mediate you know you can find a common party you can find a, a common link a good ca firm or a good lawyer or whom both the parties uh, can is uh, free to go and approach they can mediate and get to a common ground on this now moving to the uh, next case study that is transaction closed but there are continuing obligation on this the execution as well as the closing has been done the parties are sitting relaxing doing whatever is required to be done and the exit of the promoter are in tranches you know the, the first tranche was prior covid and now the tranches are coming which will get impacted because of the covid and the promoter is tense that this was the year when he was actually going to make money but this was the year when he was actually looking for a good exit plus this is also linked to a call option or a termination and all those other issues are there which needs to be evaluated now from a commercial perspective i would like nitin to throw some light and make us understand how this will and what all his experience right now going around this yeah so i think at this stage uh, certainly the risk again go to very high i would say actually very high because you know i have personally experienced some transaction and i will discuss those but risk goes high because now you are at a point of no return you have signed a binding contract you can't you know it's like a marriage you know the, the only way out is if you separate but separation will also have some cost so so it's a very very tricky situation when you sign an agreement in good faith you were not aware of the issues which might come because of covid but now you have stuck so first of the issue which can come is like escrow money if there was an escrow money which was to be paid on performance of some condition for example some performance on target some collection of debtors they might get stuck you know people might not pay revenue might not come then your escrow money gets stuck so that's first risk which happens at this stage the other risk which i would like to share a transaction which we closed last year you know there was some post closing earn out structures in place and there was a clause that the seller can only sell if the profit is for last three years the three years profit or two year profit is at least 5 crores let's say an average profit of 5 crores now because of the covid and the effect which might have that profit might not be 5 crore so then a his put options might not trigger also so he gets stuck he cannot sell that's the first trick and if he sells he has to sell at an average ebitda which will also get depressed so he will have to sell and also sell at a lower valuation so actually it's a double whammy you know which will have on the transaction if there are clauses which are linked to a performance and it gets impacted by the post covid situation in a private equity transaction also you know you might have to dilute at a lower valuation which you have expected because things like covid would not have been thought when those agreements would have been stitched so what is the solution the solution there is the only solution is to renegotiate and treat this as an exceptional item go and talk and seek extension like what we have discussed it has to be a normalized ebitda it has to be normalized earning and a normalized period so both parties need to go back and discuss and seek extension on the obligations to be performed whether it's an escrow whether it's an earn out whether it's a call or put option and i think a legal advice again at this stage would become very very critical or not over to you yeah yeah nitin you are right means so, uh, i i will say that this covid period has allowed me to go back to all my agreements and looked into it because parties are coming back and asking the same question now the one of the things which we are hearing a lot about right now with regard to force majeure now whether we can invoke a force majeure in these situation now obviously the force majeure required to be in that agreement first to invoke it secondly what is force majeure is all about now the force majeure is all about that whatever has been created whatever has been defined like generally the act of god and you know any kind of epidemic or lockdown or all these things if it's covered in your force majeure that is impacting your obligation to conclude or, or obligation to perform your uh, sorry that is creating a hindrance on your obligation which is required to be performed under the agreement now i give you two scenarios one scenario is where the promoter was asked 
to take two tranches and his obligation was only to stay in the company for two years and pay and sell the shares at the end of each year at the current valuation now the valuation has gone down but from a fourth major perspective his obligation is not getting impacted his obligation was to stay in the company for two years for transition no numbers was put to him at that point of time creating a fourth major may be a difficult but no harm in taking a chance there because ultimately it's the valuation which is getting impacted second aspect is when a promoter is required to perform what nitin has given an example has to bring in certain revenue so that he can get now there the obligation can be clearly seen getting impacted because of covid and a good chance of raising a fourth major creating this as a dead year or seeing another mechanism for exit and you know future things now what is important again here to analyze from a fourth major that is your fourth major is linked to any kind of a extension or it is linked to termination so generally termination are clubbed with call options like if you invoke as a sera and you know uh, then it will go to termination and termination will be on a call by the purchaser at a valuation which may not be very favorable to you so these things all these things has to be interlinked has to be understood properly scenario a b c worst case scenario all those things has to be draw down before taking a call on such kind of a, uh, on issues the other important issue here and that is mostly from the purchaser perspective that when the deal was done what was written in the promoter's employment contract now if a promoter promoter employment contract says and it's, if it's a well negotiated contract then it will have something like promoter's whatever perks and whatever salary and all those things has been determined and his position will not be downgraded for all these one or two years of the tranch tranches now if these kind of language is there and company is facing a situation today where they cannot sustain with such payment then the obligation will fall on the purchaser so now it's a, it's a, again it's a kind of a situation where some some power is with the pro selling promoter then some power is with the purchaser and better they sit across mediate discuss close it in a win win situation now from here i think uh, uh, we'll move forward for uh, uh, way forward where uh, you know what we have concluded and what we'll see nitin i hand it over to you to uh, you are and i think to respect time because we are almost uh, 10 minutes to go and we have to have some time for the q and a so i can we can quickly go through this slide because lot has been already discussed so from a commercial standpoint uh, just to summarize valuation will remain a challenge Uh, normalized EBITDA, which we discussed, is three. So, create evidence to prove what is a normalized EBITDA would be very important at this stage. M&A activity will remain subdued in short term, uh, but it's a great time to prepare. Normally, a deal takes nine to fifteen months. So, I think it's a time for people who are thinking about an M&A to. It's a time to pause, think, and get ready for a transaction. You know, and getting ready for a transaction involves a lot of things, putting your house in order. Uh, Stress assets and some deals. You know, of course, this is a statement I made, but Frankly, I would be proved and wrong if there are deals which are happening in aviation, which is the worst impacted sector, because there is always a value buying and a consolidation opportunity which COVID will throw. I think high focus on liquidity management and cash flow, uh, M&A or no M&A, I think everybody would need to focus on that. Preserve cash, cut non-cash, uh, non-essential items to remain profitable, because you would be valued on the profitability at the end of the day, and if it is. Very much you're know, impacted, and you need to have some kind of a sound profitability to get a valuation which you're expecting. And enhance diligence on deal. I think sanitization is a word which is uh, very, very. Uh, it's I think the household name right now. But sanitization of your books, sanitization of your financials, and getting your house in order to get ready for a due diligence is very, very critical in this situation as well. So I think these are the issues, and uh, you know, from a way forward perspective. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe you can close, and then we can take a few questions. Yeah, means uh, a quick uh, point on this. Now, post-closing structures, I think that will become more common. You know, uh, the promoters and the purchaser will think from a perspective which, where will be the final exit will be little stretched to get a good valuation there. Second is the rise in the bridge funding structure, which we already discussed. That a uh, lot of issues will be there, and that, that's why the bridge funding structures. Some of the structures will be coming in from a debt. structure but the ultimate objective of those structures are to acquire the company and debt will convert into equity at a time when the purchaser sees the risk going down on the business so those kind of a structure also is something going to happen now 
from the perspective of insolvency bankruptcy code there is a concept of package deal structure which is in the pipeline right now the discussions are on it seems like the way it will be structured that both the creditors as well as the promoters package the deal with a buyer everything is done negotiated dusted and then they go to the final approval from nclt that will save a lot of time and effort which takes place and i believe this structure should also go for going forward for our nclt driven mergers in india where a lot of things can be done before reaching the nclt and nclt job is just to see that the way the deal has been structured is not going against the law that's it uh nitin has already said about the takeover consolidation that is on the card seems like cash rich will see this as an opportunity to consolidate and create new portfolios for themselves yeah so that's the way forward which we believe so yeah we can go ahead for our q and a session thank you arnab i think uh, we have uh, almost 7 to 10 minutes for questions uh pradima if you are moderating and if you have the questions if there are any questions from the audience we'll be happy to take you can let us know If it's a question directed at uh, me on financials, I can take. Otherwise, Arunab can take on me. Sure. Uh, thanks, Nitin and Arunab. Uh, we'll now be taking uh, questions from the audience. So, if you have any uh, questions, please feel free to post it. Uh, we have, while we have got some of them already uh, during the webinar, so I'll take the first one, uh, which says, "How due diligence?" will be done where physical assets or books need to be checked or people need to be met in person during the lockdown i think i'll uh, let nitin take this one sure oh, it's a very interesting question dilma and i think uh, this time has taught us many things you know we used to think how we will do business with overseas companies how will we get first deal but i think last 40 days have told us that zoom microsoft teams uh, why have we haven't used them before so Uh, on diligence is also i think virtual data rooms which were used will now become more popular they are anyway popular in the western economies where people use data rooms like drooms etc in india we are more comfortable doing physical uh, sitting in a company's office and going through the books but i think they will have to change things will have to change and where uh, things are definitely needed to be verified of course everything can't be put on a server so those will have to be somewhere pushed to when the lockdown gets open or somewhere push to a post uh, signing stage at the cp um, to, you know, to mitigate the risk so i think it has to be a balance of online checking and a physical verification once things get settled in maybe a month or so sure thanks nitin uh the next question is on the legal aspect so i'll request uh, aruna to take uh, this forward the question is what about a scenario when an earn out is for 3 years and this is the last year can we invoke force majeure in the last year if the target has not met the uh, set uh, conditions got it uh, ridima now nice question this is something which is uh, you know all the uh, people are not worried about now there as i already said that you know if your force majeure and if your uh, these things are linked with a call option or with a termination and by invoking a force major what ultimately you are ending up is selling the same shares which you are trying to protect from a valuation perspective to the purchaser at a lower rate or a current rate then it's not going to help you so the better way to look from the perspective is that under the agreement as well as the way the business is being run what all control you have if you have a employment agreement how you are protected there second is important perspective if, if call and termination is not there then better to go for a negotiation and get a extension and this is last year so you should try to get a extension and all and the final thing i will say from especially from the purchaser perspective also that they should also see it from a perspective that where this seller has been with the company for so years and there are a lot of uh, you know from a, from a human resource others perspective also they should go for a mediation get a good chartered accountant or a good lawyer to sit with them close these issues iron it out because they have seen so ups so many ups and downs since they started this deal and this will be sorted so better to just reopen the agreement once again and understand where you are standing today thank you thanks arunab uh, we have an additional question on this aspect yeah uh 
sorry go ahead nitin no please please ask. Uh, so we have an additional question on this aspect. Uh, someone's asked, is there is there a possibility that if if the force majeure clause is not structured in the initial agreement, we can still enforce it or invoke it? Technically, that's a challenging question because force majeure is required to be there in the, in your agreement to enforce it because that is something which is a contractual obligation which party creates under the contract. But the other way, and currently we have seen the in some of the cases where parties have moved to court where the force major clause was not in their agreement, and court has taken a view which is very similar to a, a, something which a force major would have done. They have injected everything. They have said nothing doing. Don't move forward. Don't go backward. Just wait. Look down the scenario and see how the lockdown goes, and then we will hear it out. So even if the force major is not there, one can evaluate litigation as a strategy. To buy out times on such situations. Great, thanks, Arunab. Uh, next, we have uh, something on the valuation front. So it says, does historical financial information accurately reflect uh, a target that may now have a disrupted supply chain, unusual inventory levels, and is struggling with liquidity? Uh... See, historical financial situation will depend on. Uh, I guess it's a question for me, so I'll take the liberty to answer that. Uh, historical financial depends on what historical financial you are referring to, because for sure, as India is concerned, until December, technically there was no impact of COVID. So if you're talking balance sheet of December, uh, there is nothing which one needs to, you know, do on the historical financial. But if you're talking a balance sheet on 31st of March, you know, then there can be situations where you know, the impact started coming. Already the world started shutting down. Those businesses which were linked to China started getting impacted. So there might be a situation where either the revenue has gone down or there has been an increase in the inventories or increase in the receivables. Now, all those issues will have to be adjusted. All those things will have to be adjusted, not in the books for the audit purpose, because books you can't change. But whatever pro forma balance sheet and PNL you will make, as we have discussed as a normalized EBITDA, We'll have to do a normalized working capital also so that we do a fair valuation of the business. So, yes, it will be impacted if you're using a number which is anywhere close to a March 2020. Sure. Thanks, Nitin. There's a follow up question on this Are the projections uh, that were developed before COVID 19 still remain valid? Uh, my honest answer is. Uh, I think no, because uh, whether it is essential, whether it is non-essential, whether it's a red, orange, or green, whichever industry it is, you know, it, everyone is impacted. You know, except few, even those who are positively impacted would have not seen this kind of a surge. If you do a valuation of Netflix, Hotstar, or Zoom, you know, who would have thought in uh, March that you know the projections would be double, uh, you know, in terms of what they would have done. And similarly on the reverse side also. So I think my quick take on this is that. Every business, every projection will have to be relooked at uh, upside or downside uh, on this COVID scenario. Sure. Thanks, Nitin. Uh, the next one is what, what happens to the resolution plan approved by the lenders just before COVID-19 and lockdown? Should the successful bidder renegotiate the plan submitted and approved? I think I'll request Arunab to take this up. Yeah, so here, you know, it's, a, it's again a situation where a lot of facts and lots of other things have changed. And uh, in these scenarios, I believe that since all the facts and these things have changed so dramatically, that if this requires to be uh, re-looked into, then yeah, this is given the new fact situation, yeah, they can uh, renegotiate and look through it once again. Uh, I think to respect uh, Arnav, thank you very much. I think uh, we are just uh, on time. I request, if there are any more questions, I will request, uh, uh, you know, we will answer to those people who have raised questions. Uh, sorry, we'll have to respect time. And thank you very much. I wish you, you know, uh, all a very, very good, safe health. Arunab, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to say something on closing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nathan. And, uh, you know, thanks for giving this opportunity of dealing with this situation.
So, you know, I believe we have added value and somewhere our audience would have fit in into the situation and have got some solution to the queries which they would have brought in or came in while logging into this webinar. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.